Welcome everyone to the fourth episode of the Pixel Drone Show. I'm Greg Reverdio and we have Haya Kesterloo with us and also we have Dan Benowitz from uh, Drone Analyst this week as a guest and we are going to be talking about the Blue UAS program and uh, David found some really good information online and, uh, and created an awesome article on Drone Analyst. But before we jump in, uh, David, Haya, welcome to the show and... Um, David, tell us a little bit more about your aviation background and how you got into drones, how you got into analyzing drone data, because that's really what you do, and a little bit more about drone analysts in general. Yeah, yeah. And thanks, both of you guys, for having me on today. It's, it's great to be part of the, the podcast and, uh, and the show. Um, and yeah, so I'm the head of research at Drone Analyst. Drone Analyst is a consulting and research firm um, focused solely on, on drones and more specifically in kind of the commercial um, drone space, uh, founded back in 2016 by my predecessor, Colin Snow. Um, and my background is is really coming from DJI. So I worked at DJI for four and a half years, um, for four years as an associate director of marketing communications for their enterprise solutions business, and was part of the kind of founding team behind that new enterprise department over there. Um, you know, I really got interested in drones as somebody just interested in tech in general, uh, and kind of, you know, just jumped in at DJI and that's kind of where I fell in love with the products and, and everything there. I don't have such a traditional aviation background. Um, you know, I'm not a, a trained uh, aviation pilot, but uh, I, I put my, my time on the sticks at least. Outstanding. And, uh, and where are you based at? Because I know you, we have a, a long uh, time difference. Yeah, I'm, I'm based in Shenzhen, China. So um, yeah, I haven't, haven't moved since I, I left DJI. So I've, I've been camped out here throughout COVID. Um, things are are good here, and the weather's warm. Uh, you know, a uh, safe place for for the, the pandemic times. <laughs> uh, you, I, I read drone analysts quite a bit, actually. Can you tell us some of the projects that you've worked on, so that our viewers can uh, get an idea of the type of work that you guys do? Yeah, yeah. So you know what we've done since our founding, and, and kind of one of the core projects behind. A drone analyst is doing the largest survey and report about the state of the industry every year. Um, so that's that's one of the projects we released last December, um, and we do every year. Um, but in addition to that, we'll do kind of smaller snippets and reports on trends in the market, whether that be in adoption, whether that be in market share, whether that be in technology as well. Um, so you know, what we just wrote about uh, last week was more focused on the blue SUS and these new American manufacturers. Um, but we've also written on and done research on remote ID. Um, kind of consumer drone interest during COVID-19, uh, FAA registrations as well, and, and much more. Outstanding. Um, Haya, you want to get started with some of the questions? Yeah, I think we should uh, probably dive into the blue SUAS uh, right away, right? I mean, maybe we can go over which drones are part of that program and kind of what the requirements are and, and uh, how drones and drone manufacturers make sure that their drone models actually comply with all those uh, pretty strict regulations. I mean, I think it's all centered around whether drones contain any Chinese made parts, which I think if you if you look in general in, uh, into any electronics, including consumer electronics, it's probably uh, quite hard to find any product that does not contain something that's made in China at this point. Uh, I think if you open up any laptop or, or smartphone, you probably find a ton of things. Uh, but anyway, we're not here to talk about those products. We're here to talk about drones. So maybe let's start with uh, going through the list of different drones that, uh, that are part of this program. Yeah, yeah. So that's a, that's a great place to start. I guess maybe just to back up a little bit. So this is something that started by the Defense Innovation Unit, which is kind of like the Silicon Valley component of the DOD procurement um, kind of process and procedures. Um, and so they started this Blue SUS group last year and kind of started getting drones onto the list um, last year. And, you know, so far they've listed five brands and their drones as part of that as well. So we have, you know, obviously the most famous is the Skydio and their X2 drone. Um, we have Vantage Robots, the Vesper, at Altavion's Ion, Ion 40C, or I forgot the exact name there, um, the Teal One, and the Parrot uh, Anafi USA. Um, so you'll notice kind of the more most common thing in kind of the Blue SUS 1.0, as I'll kind of call it from now on, is really focused on Mavic 2 Enterprise dual equivalents. So something with a uh, an RGB sensor, something with a thermal sensor, something that's fairly small all in one package. Um, and the other interesting requirement there is that it does have to use some sort 
some type of open source control protocol as well. So they all use Mavlin. Do we uh, do we have any information as to um, how many parts of those drones might still be made in China? I mean, I think you have a pretty interesting graph in uh, in your most recent article about this. Yeah. So so the every year the DoD releases and, and prepares a report for for Congress to essentially see and, and talk about the relationship between industry and um, kind of the American America's national interest. And as part of that is seeing you know where is our military industrial complex. Uh, and its manufacturing capabilities in specific areas. And this, of course, includes the UAS. Um, and, you know, over time, the, the DOD specifically and the DI, DIU and, and kind of more specifically has been calling for us to have a, a real American-based uh, manufacturing capability for small unmanned aerial uh, systems. And so this has become not only just a requirement verbally um, and kind of what they spend their money on, but it's also become something ingrained in law. And so as part of the FY financial year 2020 NDAA bill, which essentially every year there's a new law that gives the DOD its funding, um, they released Section yep. 848. So you'll kind of see Section 848 um, posted everywhere, um, which essentially requires that the critical components be made in America or at least specifically are not made in China. Um, and so kind of one of the interesting findings from this year's report, um, as now we've had the blue SUS drones in the market decided, um, is that they're actually finding that and hinting at that, well, not just hinting, but also saying that a lot of these drones still rely significantly on Chinese components. So um, there's a graph here, you know, we can kind of average out that maybe about 10 to 20 percent of the components are still of Chinese origin. Um, and, you know, specifically, you know, we're talking about like gimbals, motors, navigation systems, uh, even the PCBs as well. Um, and even some computer and software are of, of Chinese origin still. So at least some of these drones, and this is kind of taken from two or three of the drones in the Blue SUS group, some of these drones do not meet that requirement and instead have to go through a waiver process, which essentially means they're not kind of these DIU Blue SUS drones do not meet kind of the made in America full on standard um, and have to kind of mm -hmm. themselves go through a, a back a, a back channel to to be purchased. So th that's that's really, really interesting. Um so this waiver process, how far does it go? How far can you waive the, the requirements? Could, could DJI, I mean, we know this was a, a move to mostly remove a lot of the DJI product. Could DJI actually apply and get a waiver for this? Yeah, I mean, I mean certainly anyone could theoretically get a waiver. Um, the waiver is from the purchasing side. So it's, it's not necessarily from, from the supplier side of things. Um, so, you know, there would have to be demand. I would say there's still a lot of political pressures on agencies to avoid buying EGI products for actual usage. There's obviously been hints that they're using them for CUAS testing purposes. Um, but, you know, I, I would say it's unlikely that DJI gets a waiver just through the political situation. Just an example of that is, you know, the uh, DJI and the DOI, the uh, Department of Interior, work together on a, a custom solution for them that's more data secure. After they did release a, a very large report that's public um, saying that the DJI products are data secure, they eventually pulled back later, pretty much due to political reasons. So I would say that yeah. you know it's technically possible, but it's very unlikely in the current situation. So the the political landscape is different. Obviously, we had an election, we had a change of colors uh, in the, the president, and not to get political or anything, but but do we see a change coming? Maybe I mean no, none of us can really predict this, but uh, with the new administration, could the the rules be relaxed and and can we see DJI again? you know, fighting for these, providing these drones, because the, it's a large percentage. I think I read somewhere, I don't remember where I read it, but that it's 10%, I think it was from you actually, David, 10% of the drones sold right now in the US are related to uh, to the blue UAS type of customers. Is that is that right? Um, so it's, it's a little bit different than that. But so if you were to take the, the size of the DOD's procurement budget for small UAS, mm -hmm. Um, as a portion of the U.S. market of small UAS uh, for all commercial and, and, and consumer, um, you'd kind of get a number that's about 10%. Um, they're, actually, the DOD's estimate's a bit lower. My, my critique to them is that, um, you know, unfortunately for people in the industry, the industry is not as large as they expect. Um, so, so there's kind of a little bit of nuance in there. Um, and just for reference, their budget for, for SUAS does not mean that they actually spent it. But what they set aside was about 150 million um, USD as uh, as of last year, um, and yeah. So it, it, this is quite important to the larger structure. 
um, other market. To, to go to the, the political question, um, you know, that's, that's, I think, one thing all of us have been waiting to see is like, how does Biden's administration react differently, um, especially because we did see Trump's executive order come in the last week that he was in office that targeted specifically yeah. um, UAS made in quote unquote adversary countries. But of those adversary countries, only one legitimately makes small and aerial systems, which is China. Um, so, you know, there was a lot of targeting from Trump's administration. Additionally, the entity list is in some way a political decision um, from the Commerce Department that could be rolled back as well. Um, not both the Trump's executive order and the entity list edition of DJI have not been rolled back, which does not mean that the Biden's administration doesn't want to. But, you know, you can think of it from Biden's administration, whether or not they look kindly on DJI specifically uh, in general. They are still in many ways tough on China. Um, in many ways, both parties right now in these days are tough on China and they're not going to give anything away for free. So my theory, at least my prediction is until we see a legitimate you know, trade deal between U.S. and China coming together on, on new terms, we likely won't see action on any shifts to the NT list edition or even Section 848 or um, Trump's executive order. And, you know, very interestingly, the DIU did refer to Trump's executive order more recently, even during the Biden administration. So it seems that that will still be in effect. Yeah, it's a good bargaining chip for them, for sure. I got a question for you, David. I mean, when we uh, when we review no, drones uh, at at the end of every article, when we review new drones or talk about new drones, we always end up with pricing and availability, right? I mean, where can I buy this? How much is it going to cost? When can people ship these drones to me? Now, if you look at let's say very capable models uh, such as the DJI Mavic Enterprise Advanced or the uh, Autel Robotics Evo 2 Dual, um, at least those drones are price competitive, and you should be able to to get them fairly easily, right? I mean, DJI and auto are, are both auto maybe a little less so but are able to produce drones quickly and in, in large enough quantities uh, david can you tell us a little bit about those blue suas drones and, and tell us about pricing and about the uh, production capacity that these companies have to deliver drones in the, in the numbers that let's say the uh, department of the uh, department of the interior would require yeah um i mean specifically the department of interior requirement um it, you know, their requirement is not as heavy. Uh, I mean, we always focus on government purchase of drones, but, you know, realistically, I haven't purchased that many drones. Last time I checked was around 600. Um, you know, not to say that any of these companies other than DJI could prepare and, and ship 600 units tomorrow, um, which is kind of the state of the market and kind of what you're, you're getting at here, right? Um, you know, starting up a new manufacturing process, starting up a new line of business, um, even in China, but then setting up a whole new manufacturing process in the U.S. is incredibly difficult and it takes a lot of time. Um, and so what we're seeing is that just most of these drones and these units haven't hit the market quite yet. I mean, from my conversations with distributors and, you know, from the two weeks ago, so I haven't gotten the most up-to-date information, is, you know, they are starting to see the Parrot and Offy USA more broadly available in the market. The Teal is just starting to reach the market as well, but just to a few select dealers. And then, you know, Skydio is going direct to sale or through Axon, so it's not quote unquote, widely available. You can't go online and buy it. You can't find any distributor and buy it. Um, whereas at least Autel and DJI are, are widely available on the market today. Uh, on the price topic, you know, you're right there. Um, most of these guys don't release pricing publicly, so I won't, I guess, out them. Um, but in general, you're looking for maybe about 30 to 40% higher in cost um, there. Yeah. yeah, that's what I heard as well. And sometimes even uh, a multitude, like two two or three times more expensive than uh, than a comparable drone. Um, it just, the, the point that I'm getting at basically is that those blue SUS drones are not always as capable and they are, I think, in every case more expensive, sometimes a lot more expensive. And basically when you look at drones being used to save people's lives or to do other good in the world, uh, it would be beneficial to get more drones put to work. And with taxpayer money, you can only buy so many drones. So having a more capable drone at a lower price point I think would be beneficial um, and like we've been discussing I think the whole blue uh, SUAS uh, program is, is very much politically motivated uh, all these drones as far as I can tell still contain parts that are made in China and so do the uh, the uh, auto Evo 2 and the, uh, the DJI drones of course but I think that rather than focusing on country of origin I think it would make a lot more sense to define certain standards and, and data security standards and then as long as you're able to meet 
meet those standards, your drone should be part of this program. And it doesn't matter if they're made in France or Vietnam or Taiwan or China or wherever. Um, but anyway, that's that's a world that we, uh, we don't seem to live in quite yet, but <laughs> I think it'd be better. Yeah. I'm curious on your um, your thoughts about Otiri and their role in government UAS. I got to interview yeah, Dave Sharp and their CEO. That's a, that's a super good question. Um, yeah. Uh, can we get to that later, actually? Uh, I, I, I really like yep. it, though. And I think it's also important yeah. to assess just open source in general by the DOD, which is, like, for me, one of the most fascinating things of Q1 this year, which I'm still digging into. But it's a really good question. You know, we always have, you know, when the government steps in and makes a political decision on something that is about real operations or about the real economy, there is a negative impact there. And so the question is always... What is that trade-off in, in the market? Um, you know, and, and government permits themselves are never truly open market. There's always a preference for domestic products. Um, there always has been, you know, there's a Buy American Act and there's, there's much more there. Um, so yeah. I think when it comes down to government procurements and then more specifically DOD procurements, which, you know, there is an industrial military complex that needs to be established in the U.S. If war were to happen, we were to think who could militarize the most small unmanerical systems in the quickest time the answer would certainly be China. So you can understand why they want to prop up some type of domestic manufacturing base. Um, what I yeah. have larger concern with is, yeah, your point to like start stopping operations with DOI, specifically with DJI products, has had a, a negative effect. Um, there's some great reporting by, by yourselves and also even the FT on how the stopping of DOD's, DOI's drone program has impacted wildfire preparedness um, last year. And that's, that's hugely negative. Yeah. Um, the other aspect yeah. here is that, you know, looking two years ago when the market was even more dominated by DJI in the enterprise space, um, most of the most of the actual rules were not rules, but instead security claims, uh, security reports coming out, um, raising questions about DJI that weren't necessarily fully publicized, although certainly there were a few. Um, and that's had a larger impact on purchases and, and kind of a, a, a slowing effect on purchases as well. You know, in our, in our 2020 report, when we asked people about how have Chinese security concerns impacted purchases, 27% of them said that they have. And of those that were affected, more than half of those said that it slowed down their purchases. So people are taking more time to consider, is the drone I'm using secure? Maybe it's impacting management and how they even view programs. You know, I know drone programs that themselves have completely paused over the past year because of the security concerns, because they've already invested in 30, 40 DJI drones. And they don't know where to go next because, you know, we're talking still about the small sliver of the market that is RGB and thermal equipped drones. And we're starting to see competition there. But what happens when you're a company doing construction on or near military bases and you need a drone with an RTK unit on it? Is there really something that competes with the Phantom 4 RTK and cost price and ease of use as well? So this is kind of, you know, I would say it's fair game for, for the U.S. government to nationalize in some way the, the military drone segment. Um, when it starts to see negative impacts across the broader industry and slowing down of adoption, I'd say that's a larger net impact and a slowdown of the market that's completely unnecessary. Um, and it's a completely mm -hmm. you know net loss to the US economy. Yeah. Now, to, to, to uh, follow up on this, I mean, we know that Parrot pretty much got out of the uh, consumer drone market and focuses exclusively now on defense. We know Skydio has had a hard time uh, making their deliveries uh, to, to customers who prepaid for their Skydio S2 drones. Uh, meanwhile, they shifted to defense and enterprise markets as well. Uh, is it fair to say that maybe those companies feel that they might not be able to compete with DJI and Autel and therefore are now flocking to a safer, more protected market, uh, which is called the blue SUES world, if you will? Yeah, to some degree, yes. And, and you have to kind of understand why, right? Like, the amount of drones that DJI can produce at the cost that they can produce them is just completely different. I mean, even Autel, when we're talking about the consumer market, they can compete at the premium consumer market. But when we're looking at like a mini alternative, um, producing a drone at $400, $500 at a, at a margin that's actually reasonable uh, is very hard. Uh, and there's a lot of automation involved. There's a lot of investment that DJI's put into that at the early stages of the market that let them get there that just, you know, no one else necessarily can. So, I mean, you can see, I mean, there's a, there's a potential future here for a company that's like Skydio that has a, a really good investment where 
they can start making profit in the military and the enterprise segments and slowly push back into the consumer side of things. Um, and that's, you know, a pretty a appealing story. But I mean, producing drones in the U.S. at mass scale at a price of four hundred, five hundred, six hundred dollars. Um, I mean, even looking at the Mavic Air, is anything really at that price level? You know, the S2 is just above that. If you start adding the accessories, it's much more. Um, the Autel, what the uh, Evo 2 Pro and the Evo 2 are also just above that as well. Um, so you can kind of put a question, I think even among Chinese companies, competing with DJI is tough, um, especially when you're doing it on cost. So it's better to do in areas where cost doesn't matter as much and you can focus on software, you can focus on um, other things like customer relations, sales, and um, really understanding the market. Well, DJI is leading the customer service for for drones <laughs> they have very famous really great customer service <laughs> yeah, yeah i yeah i everyone always says good things about dj's customer service you know I've, I've never heard any complaints so david i, I the best thing is as a dj employee going to events uh sometimes and getting pulled aside like what happened with this and you know i'll chase it down afterwards and it's you know, it's, it's kind of a black hole of, of, of pain. And, you know, I feel bad at times for, for a lot of these bad stories that have happened. Yeah. Well, so David, the, when I, when I, about a decade ago, my, my background is flight training and about a decade ago in the flight training world, what we saw was a resurgence of, uh, aircraft that are, that are called sport aircraft and the, the sport aircraft or light aircraft, they're like the size of a Cessna 172, but a bit smaller. And there was a specific certificate that went with it. It still does a sport pilot license. And when that happened, we saw obviously the cost of fuel at the time was huge and we saw about a hundred different manufacturers flood the markets because there was this big need for having a trainer that was really cheap and um and and then a year later we had 10 manufacturers that were left because everybody was competing you know at the with, with 100 different manufacturers at that level and all of a sudden nobody could survive and everybody just kind of consolidated and uh, even the large manufacturers gave up on the idea and then we only had a few products left. I'm almost at the point now where I'm seeing this industry doing somewhat of the same. Everybody is trying to jump on the bandwagon of creating a drone because there's a lot of demand out there. And then all of a sudden, as we keep going, we have fewer and fewer uh, people and everything is going to get consolidated. So. I guess my question is, we have five uh, blue UAS at the moment. Is the program going to get larger from, you know, what you've seen? Or are we going to stay with these five? Or are these five ever going to be going down to two? I mean, I'm asking you to predict the future. Obviously, this is kind of your, your best guess, but your educated guess, what do you think? Yeah, so, uh, I mean, luckily, I don't have to guess that much for this question. So the blue SU, the DIU, the Defense Innovation Unit, um, they, they regularly release new solicitations and about a month ago, they released a blue SUS 2.0 solicitation. And so if we can see the 1.0 and kind of where I'm renaming it that, cause now we have 2.0, so it must've been 1.0, even though they didn't call it that at the time. If 1.0 is really focused on this, um, Mavic 2 Enterprise dual style quadcopter, um, an all-in-one drone, the blue SUS 2.0 is much more focused on a more open uh, platform that can have different hot swappable payloads, um, a, a bit more of an open source when it comes down to adding, for example, extra compute power on the fly there as well. Um, so, you know, we're probably looking at something that's a bit more of an M200, M300 style airframe, um, or I think the Freefly Astro, when I first read the solicitation, that's what my mind went immediately to. Mm -hmm. So we are seeing some progressing in the blue, the, the blue SUS program. Um, you know, in, in the future, if, if the, the if the DIU's kind of efforts in this space keep on working, I wouldn't be surprised if they build out a number of different, essentially, requirements with th several, maybe one to two different manufacturers in each. You know, I think right now, the five that we have in one segment, you're right, there's going to be some type of consolidation in that market pretty soon. Um, but we'll probably have three to four different size types of drones that need to be used by the military and eventually by the broader government. And they follow a few different paths. And there's probably you know, one or two or three different brands competing in each space. Um, if you look at the military's larger spending on UAS in general, that's where you kind of have, you have like five to six contractors. Many of them are kind of more traditional military industrial, military industrial complex. 
manufacturers. And then there's AeroVironment, who's very focused on, on UAS, um, dominating in that space. Um, so we'll kind of see that maturity of the segment there. We won't continue to have five competing contractors or brands in, in each segment of the Blue S US group. Well, is it is it my turn to ask about Oterian and what you see their role? Yeah, there's a really ask. nice seg segue there. Um, <laughs> yeah, I asked earlier. Can I ask you a question for you? <laughs> What's that? Can I ask a question for you? Which is, you know, essentially... I'm, I'm gonna kind of I'm gonna lead into your question. Uh, we'll do it like that because I think it, I think it fits so ne nicely in here, um, which is you know one common thing and a nice progression that's happened throughout the different 1.0 then 2.0 Blue SUS solicitations is the change in the open source requirement. Um, so in the 1.0, it was just in general a open source architecture. Um, in this 2.0, it's now specifically an open source communications protocol. Um, and then what we saw right after that was there's a specific solicitation for a all-in-one robotic controller. And I, I'm kind of ruining their name. They have like a, a nice, smoother name, more technical name. Um, but essentially one controller that can control multiple different robots. And they call specifically for it to use Mavlink, which is an open source protocol. Um, and so this takes us then to kind of Alterion, Drone Code, the P PX4 ecosystem of things. Um, which are these groups of different open source protocols, whether it be flight controllers or communication protocols that are happening here. And so the Blue SUS group has specifically started to really, I guess, enforce or, or push in some way the requirement of Mavlink, which, you know, you can develop your own flight controller or you can have a PX4 flight controller that works natively with it. As an issue, Mavlink sits as that uh, communication device between the remote controller and the drone, or in some way you can have your own app that communicates the Mavlink that then communicates to the drone. Um, so to make everything kind of speak the same language. And, and so they are kind of pushing that, you know, Mavlink is part of, you know, Alterion is part of drone code, which is kind of their software, which speaks to uh, Mavlink. And also Mavlink is the native communications protocol to their Skynet or sorry, their, I forgot the name of their flight controller. Uh, but whatever their flight controller is, and they have a government version, they have a, a standard version as well. Um, so this kind of fits really nicely into this new open source ecosystem we're starting to see, you know, based around Alterion, based around drone code, drone code based around the PX4 um, architecture. Yeah, I had, um, I had the opportunity to interview Dave Sharpen a while back for Inner Drone, And so, yeah, I got some um, really unique insights. And Greg, maybe we can um, put the link in um somewhere and so people can read up on some background because he had some um really valuable insights and it's exciting that romeo dersher uh joined them as well so i think they're going to do a lot of great things together yeah, yeah. he's the the best drone storyteller <laughs> <laughs> David, I wanted to loop back to the the list of parts that are in a drone and the ones that are from Chinese origin and the ones that are not. Uh, as we get to the larger drone, the 2.0, uh, we're talking about much larger drones with much bigger payload. China obviously has been doing a great job at creating these cameras. Do we have other sources that are reliable, high quality? Uh, I know Japan has some really good sources as well for cameras uh, that can equip these version 2.0 drones so that it doesn't become an issue uh, all over again. Yeah, I mean, it's it's going to be a long, long push, right? Um, and it's going to take a lot of time because of the nature of how the drone industry has evolved. It's all kind of evol evolved around um, DJI's platform. So a lot of the most cost effective stuff is kind of built around it. You know, even a lot of American made stuff like slant range, um, like, uh, and there's quite a few others, even FLIR is making a lot of new payloads, um, around DJI's kind of P payload SDK. Um, so, you know, there's not too much that's available domestically on these open source platforms. Um, and this kind of takes me once again to Alterion, which is like, there's, there's kind of a solution for this in the short term which is the drone code, Alterion kind of ecosystem combined together, have standardized a new you know, payload development bus, which is a standard port that can be put and fixed onto um, any type of drone that's using its flight controller or using Mavlink as well, um, and adopting to that standard. So kind of the problem before was if you were even a US manufacturer uh, building a payload for a US made drone, there's not enough of a market there for you to really make enough money. Um, so that's why everyone kind of moved towards DJI platforms, and the idea is as we start to open source and, and make a common standard around um, this more open source, you know, gimbal style or, or payload bust, um, 
theoretically, the, the market for payload developers to build on that platform will be inherently larger. Um, but still, we're talking about units that are just coming to market. So, I, you know, I don't expect we'd see a lot of U.S. made payloads on U.S. made drones in the hot swappable fashion that, that is possible on the DJI platform. Um, but at least there is kind of a pathway um, in that direction. Um, I think just the perfect example for this is the Freefly Astro, which is kind of the first, you know, uh, and, and Inspired Fly do this well. I shouldn't, I shouldn't just prioritize one manufacturer. I, whoever's any of those other manufacturers that want to want to at me, at me. I'm sorry. Um, I'm promoting you guys all. It's uh, you know, there's quite a few quite a few people working on the um, on the PX4 system now. Um, but yeah, so so the Freefly Astro is a really good example because it, even now it's kind of just starting to come to market. It hasn't quite yet. Um, so you'll see kind of the payload development will lag behind what hardware is in the market. Do you think that Freefly would have the capacity to ramp up their production and deliver drones in larger numbers or? I mean, I mean, the, the larger airframes are inherently, they don't have to be in such a large number, right? Um, you know, and, and, you know, once you move from a Mavic style airframe to something more like the Matrice, the, the quantity drops off significantly. Um, so at least they, they'd be able to catch up quicker. Yeah. Do we know what's and happening we, with Freefly's Astro? Um, just quick question. Sorry about the segue. Um, I thought it was yeah, last to be I out heard, by now. I yeah, last I heard, it, it had, isn't quite shipping yet. Um, but yeah, I think it was supposed to be shipping at the end of last year. Yeah. And the Sony, uh, what is it? Air, the Sony Airpeak, does that fit oh, in there that? somewhere? I mean, Sony will be able to ah, deliver. I, I love yeah, yeah, I, it's very exciting, right? I, I mean, I think the airframing itself is a bit more of a small, uh, you know, a small supply unit for them. I mean, I don't think they're setting up a factory to produce that just based on the look of it. It looks like something that's a bit more of a small batch unit just from like the way it looks configured. Um, so, you know, I, I think it's something that they're probably testing out with key customers. And you can imagine Sony has a lot of contacts in the, you know, creative professional market and they'll probably start there. I haven't heard of anyone receiving units yet. Um, which is super interesting. So I, I'm very excited about what's happening there. Um, but I think when it comes down to what's on the market today, they still have some time to get there. Yeah, I thought it was interesting as well, because if you if you think about, okay, who might be able to compete with a, a company like DJI and who would have the deep pockets and the production capacity, then companies like Sony or Samsung, for instance, or maybe even Apple uh, would come to mind. But I, I wonder if any of those companies would really be interested in, in going into the drone market, because compared to their existing markets, the drone world is probably not big enough. But uh, that's what kind of caught my interest when, when I heard about Sony and their air peak drones like hey you guys are getting into drone now so i mean that that's an, that's an interesting development for sure definitely and, and you know I, I think it makes sense for them to focus and on what it seems like they're focusing on which is kind of the niche of the creative professional space um where they can yeah. start at a higher price model and and do what they do best which is make really great cameras and make a really great camera drone um that is for the highest level of professionalism out there um yeah. and and focus on that you know when it comes down to competing on these lower cost units, the amount of investment involved in setting up a factory operation, sourcing all the different technology and, and building a lot of it out. Cause you know, drones are quite complex nowadays. I mean, all the tech that goes into a Mavic mini is, is starting to get really impressive. Um, yeah. uh, there's a lot of systems on systems in that drone and, and even any drone that's made by any of these manufacturers. So, you know, while, while in many ways, I think we're focusing on a lot of negatives of these new hardware manufacturers. It's also important to recognize as someone in the industry, just how much work goes into you know, making one of these drones. Um, even these new requirements like remote ID, you have to start planning for that. And that's just a new system you have to build on top of existing systems. Not that it's inherently hard, but just everything, all this stuff takes time, you know? Um, and a drone is is quite complex already. Oh yeah, and it shows, right? I mean, if you look at the original Phantom series and then compare that to, let's say, uh, a DJI Mavic Air 2 and how easy it is to fly and how capable that drone is and how inexpensive it is considering the capabilities. I mean, uh, over the years, DJI has made uh, a lot of progress in making drones easy to use, easy to fly, safe to fly, and at the same time, deliver the video and photo uh, quality that people are looking for. Yeah, no, certainly. Yeah, and anyone trying to get into this business is is got 
several years to catch up too, right? They have to run much faster than DJI to catch up and and then continue to innovate at the same time as DJI is. I mean, it, it's it every year it's getting harder and harder for somebody to come in and take over DJI. And I mean, I love my DJI drones. I love flying them, but I also love competition because at the end of the day, we all win when there is competition because there is innovation and there is all these things that we wouldn't get if DJI was the only one out there. You know, they have no incentive to really put a new drone out. Uh, so... It's good. You know, Apple, to me, in my head, is probably one of the only one that has the capital, if they wanted to do this, to really go after DJI and create a, a product uh, that, that could compete. Uh, you know, they have the cell phones already. They have, it, it kind of follows with, you know, they, they, they do, they took over the, the pho photography market, if you think about it, with the cell phone, with their, their cameras. More and more people are just using, and I, myself included, I've been taking photos for years and years and years, and more and more, I just rely on my phone because it's right there and it's available, and I don't want to pull a big camera from the backpack. So they've changed the industry in a sense just with their, their cameras on the phone. So why not take that technology and put it on the drone? So, you know, I'm not in Tim Cook's head, but um, if, I, if, I were, uh, <laughs> if I were a betting man, I bet you they're probably looking into this and car. Obviously, they, they want to compete with Tesla and uh, and build the next car. So, uh, the EV market's much bigger than the drone market, though. So we'll, we'll see. I think it'll it, it, it's an interesting decision, you know, by them uh, on which way to take. Um, and I, I think it may be an interesting way to look at this, and and maybe something we don't explore too much in depth here is um, as kind of like the, the Silicon Valley versus Shenzhen. Um, you know, Apple's now competing with several companies based in Shenzhen more globally. If you look at these markets outside of the U.S., like with Oppo, OnePlus, who are all both owned by the same company, um, and there's quite a few others that are that are out there in the smartphone market that are just pushing the price super far down. Um, you know, Apple might be saying this low margin business for people who are based in the city where we're also manufacturing. You know, do we want to really enter a new space that's like that when they can probably go to the EV market, which will be higher margin? higher value for them as well. So I, I would say like, it's, it's interesting. I'd, I'd really wonder, like, I'd really love to pick their brains on it. Um, it'd be very interesting to see how they see kind of the ecosystem of, of consumer electronic manufacturing in the world and where they want to compete. Um, but it would be interesting on how they, you know, how they see DJI's infrastructure, manufacturing supply chain and part of the larger ecosystem. Cause we, we can never see really how DJI may compete with one of these CE giants. Are they really so far ahead with so many years in advance that they would, beat out one of these guys just because of that huge advantage or would this be a, a much more even fight than we'd think it's it, it would be like it's the, probably the most fascinating thing we may not ever know um but yeah it would be it'd be very fun to watch let, let me see if tim cook is available you're writing a letter to tim cook i'll sign in on it <laughs> yeah let me see if he's available for next week's uh, podcast we'll bring him on board <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> let me get him on my I, calendar I, i'll send him a meeting invite we'll get something going i know he lit he listens every week so it's interesting though right because when when uh when apple introduced the iphone uh i think you can probably argue that in the in the first following years their their mac and and laptop uh, divisions basically kind of suffered as a result i think i think a lot of the attention went into developing the iphone coming up with new features developing the app store and all that stuff and then and i've been an, an apple user for quite some years it always felt that the macbook pros and the imacs and stuff kind of were almost not quite forgotten but they were on the back burner compared to all the attention that went to the iphone and i think if you if you look at apple and you look at dji i mean there's definitely some overlap and i think that dji looks at apple in terms of their marketing their communication the way they present new products but i think what separates dji in my mind at least is that uh, DJI seems to be a lot more aggressive, like they have no issue cannibalizing their own products. I mean, they launched the Mavic Mini and a year later they come out with the Mini 2, which basically blows the original Mavic Mini out of the water. Uh, they launched the DJI Mavic Air 2 and now they're coming out with the S2 soon, at least that's been rumored. Uh, and it seems like that drone is gonna, is gonna blow the original out of the water as well and we're only a year uh, further down the road and I think I don't really know of any other consumer electronics companies that are that aggressive, not only to their external competition, but even competing with their own their own products. Yeah, and it, it, that's been a really key part of, of DJI um, from their culture. And, and actually, the way they used to incentivize PMs was essentially they'd have to outcompete each other for the same product line. And their profits, or I guess their, their annual bonus was tied to the performance of the specific product, not the company overall. Um, so they were kind of trying to kill each other in many ways, which 
led to some really great developments. It's, it's changed a lot since, but um, as you can imagine, imagine, but yeah, I mean, even in the past two years, I mean, there's kind of a lull if you look at like 2016, 27, 2018, and then 2019, 2020, um, you know, or sorry, 2018, 2019 is a lot slower than the years before. And also the, the current years as well. Yeah. The Mavic mini then did probably eight months between the two of them. Um, and now the air two and the air two S is, is also a pretty aggressive timeline in between. Um, so I think it kind of says that they're seeing some pressure. Um, I think some worried behind things and they realize they need to keep on innovating. It's, um, you know, yeah. we aren't seeing that competitive competition for those lines, but at least it's good to see them moving as if there is, um, I also have another, I was just thinking of this today, which is like, you know, we're seeing a lot of these rumors around the Air 2S, um, which I think are quite, quite fascinating. I can't see why it would make sense to replace it though. Um, and so my mind then went back to the entity list and the supply of this, and I, I haven't gotten my hands on one and it'd be interesting to do a, a breakdown of it, of it afterwards. But, you know, my initial theory was a lot of the consumer drones did have some type of more US made components, whether it be Intel chips or um, yeah. or TI um, ESCs or something like that in them. Um, so not ESCs, chips. BMSs. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't put so much money on the Nvidia chips. They're not putting TX twos in these okay. things. Um, but uh, you know, I, I would love to see eventually the Air two S broken down. What my bet is due to the timing, they probably ran out of some components for the original Air, and then kind of spun this into a new one. And it's a much more efficient and better marketing way to sell out the existing stock that they have of the air and then replace it with a new model um, without it being an entity list edition. But that, that's pure speculation. Um, you know, I might yeah. get a message from, from Adam Lisberg after, after this goes live saying like, that's complete nonsense. Um, but you know, that's just what I was thinking. It's, it's almost too crazy to, to out, you know, the air has no competition yeah. pretty much. Uh, and to replace it this quickly or, or to overshadow it this quickly, maybe the price is higher. Maybe they're, Maybe this is really a Mavic 2 Pro replacement and they're pricing higher. Oh. I, 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 you know, I'm, I'm interested to see. Like, there's a lot to see. There's a lot of speculation uh, out there in the market because, you know, DJI can't hold a secret. Um, so I'll, I'll continue to speculate. <laughs> well, it, it's, it's interesting, right? Because not only does it compete with the original Mavic 2 Air, but it, like you pointed out, the uh, Mavic 2 Pro and Zoom, I mean, why would you even want to buy those at higher prices when you are going to be able to buy the... Uh, the new one for less and probably just as capable, maybe even more capable. I wish I could yeah. say more. Um, I can't yet. Um, I do have something on me, but I can't say anything yet. Unfortunately, I had to sign a strict NDA, but it'll be exciting. Put it that way. <laughs> yeah, no, sounds good. I'll, I'll, I'll message some people. We'll see what we can figure out. <laughs> I'm joking. It makes you wonder what the Mavic 3 is going to be able to do in order to create enough of a distance between the S uh, 2S. I mean, when the when the Air, yeah, when the Air 2 came out, I was surprised because it, it seemed like it was a direct competitor to the 2 Pro. You know, except the size of the sensor, but the megabit per second was actually higher, 150 over 100. And then you still had great quality. You had 4K 60, which you don't still don't have on the, the Mavic 2 Pro. Now the sensors was always the thing. You know, they have a, a top sensor and a, and a side sensor, uh, which you don't have on the uh, Air version. Now you do, it looks like from the new one, the, the pictures we've seen, we have at least top sensors, not side sensors. So, and then the, the aperture, I think they're always keeping that, that changeable aperture as uh, as the last thing to go into the pro model. But to me, that's almost not enough for somebody to say, hey, I'm going to spend the extra money just to get an aperture that I can change. Uh, photographers like this, I like it, but uh, I know the, the vast majority of people don't really care for that. So it, it'll definitely be interesting. Other than the bigger sensor, mm -hmm. Micro Four Third, it's the next level for putting that, but that's getting into the Inspire level. Uh, you know, we talked about this last week, actually, in the podcast. It's, it's going to be really interesting to see where they go. I mean, the Inspire has been what three or four years now it hasn't been taught well no yeah. inspire 2 is what like late last updated in end of 20 yeah, four years yeah four years no it's been yeah, yeah. it's 2017 yeah it was the end of 2017 yeah. like in november <laughs> oh wow um yeah. it's been a while <laughs> yeah. yeah i mean the, and it's it's, the, it's the, not the, it's, it's not even yeah. just the drone that's uh, getting outdated it's also the camera uh on the inspire 2 that's that's getting old at this point so that might need some uh, replacements yeah. 
Well, and it doesn't even have OQSync. I mean, it is a technology before OQSync. So they've, they've skipped OQSync 1.0, 2.0, and then now 3.0. So yeah, it, in terms of technology, it's ancient. I mean, I still love it. I have one and it's still my favorite John to fly. But... <laughs> is that what we're going to end up seeing in the Maverick 3? Like a merging of the, let's say, what should have been the Phantom 5 and then the Inspire 3 and then the Maverick 3 is going to kind of include all those features that we would expect from a drone at that price point? It's it's possible. I mean, I always think in some way DJI's left the creative market and, and kind of the the premium creative market. So like kind of above two thousand with these like hot swappable payloads. Mm -hmm. You know, it hasn't been touched for a long time. Um, is it because they don't want to operate in that market? Is it because uh, a lot of different ideas there? But uh, you know, maybe that's something to give up. Maybe there's going to be this like mix of the Phantom plus the Mavic. That's something more of, of value. Uh, you know, DJI did do that swappable lens version of the the Phantom 4 Pro. You could see something like that coming in. But yeah, maybe a larger Mavic. Maybe I, I'm kind of always I always love the idea of the hot swappable payloads. Um, I think it's a lot of work to do, yeah. but I don't think we'll get that on a Mavic sized airframe quite yet until there's real competition because you also start to eat in your own margins there. David, we're getting close to the end, but I have a few more questions I want to ask uh, a little bit away from the topic we've been talking about. Uh, what do you fly? What's your favorite drone? Oh, uh, yeah, I've, I haven't been flying that much recently, um, but I have, an, I have an Air 2, so I've been flying that. Um, we're going to the beach tomorrow, so I'll fly that. Um, but yeah, that's, you know, I always have access to the latest. So I, I didn't actually own a drone before I left DJI because I would always just take one. Um, and I was able to uh, become the owner of an Air 2 after I left. And uh, we'll, we'll just say that. And uh, yeah, that's what I've been flying. And what's next with Drone Analyst? What's your next big project, if you can talk about it? Oh, yeah, no, we can, we can talk about it. I mean, for us, we're, we're you know, so, so one thing actually, and Carl would probably be interested, but doing kind of a smaller thing and look into this type of open source requirements and, and what's the situation of it in the market. Um, and then kind of some more medium term projects. Uh, we'll be releasing kind of our first market sizing and market forecast um, actually this month. Um, so we're just, we're just finishing up the publication for that and, and getting through all that. So that'll be... You know, the idea is the most accurate um, real data on the actual size of the commercial consumer and agriculture spraying segments of the market that we've had since. And um, so I'm pretty excited about that. And then we'll also be diving into security, um, kind of a, a more fact-based way to assess security features of the product before you purchase um, as sort of some type of buying guide for people to have some free information online. They can, you know, get through this political stuff we're kind of hinting at here and see what are the real security features and requirements. Because actually a lot of these blue SUS drones do a really interesting job on security. So something we'll dig a bit more into. Um, but sorry, that was a very long <laughs> explanation of things upcoming. No, it's, it's, uh, it's useful stuff. It's interesting. I've That's been a huge fan of drone analyst for ages. Um, just the best insights make sense of everything that's going on. So it's a great gig you have there. <laughs> Thanks, thanks. Uh, yeah, I feel I feel trapped in Shenzhen though. I'm I'm looking forward to hopefully going to some events at the second half of this year and and meeting people face to face for, for what's been almost two years now or over a year now of of I miss, yeah, yeah being being in China, <laughs> being separated from the market in many ways. I miss the big uh, DJI release events because they're always so much fun. They're always so well done. So yeah, that is something I think we're all looking forward to. Is not yeah, only yeah. being able to see each other I mean, in person, but um, getting back to yeah. those as well. Yeah, I mean, those I would agree stopped that. before COVID as well. So I wonder if they'll really pick back up. Um, yeah. But yeah, um, they're always exciting ones. And even Airworks too. The same, Although, same, go, yeah, is always stressful. Say, same goes same goes for all the uh, conventions and stuff, right? Where we get to uh, to meet each other again. Maybe at one point we, uh, we're going to be able to do a uh, Pixel Drone show actually in person, all in the same room. That'd be fun. But uh, we'd love to have you back on the show, David, for sure. I mean, uh, it sounds like you got a lot more going on. So whenever yeah. you have new news, be sure to reach out. Yeah, sounds good. Thanks for having me on the show. Thanks for joining us, David. Always a pleasure.